right. So how did you get into filmmaking? Yeah. So um, I got into it when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was um, in a in a workshop that was part of like a queer film festival that was in Saskatoon um, in 95. And it was just for that one year. They never did that festival again. Um, but yeah, they had Maureen Bradley come out and she taught sort of like um, video art practices and so we made a video for that weekend and um that was called lessons in baby dyke theory and it was about trying to find other lesbians because at the time i was identifying as a lesbian and was for like quite a long time but um yeah and like trying to find other queers in high school and not being able to find them and it was kind of this short cute video i think it was like three and a half minutes maybe five minutes um and it kind of like in the in the mid 90s, there wasn't a lot of work being done by queer youth in the video art world. So I mean, except for Sadie Denning, which they all compared me to. But um, but yeah, so it like it traveled to like all these queer film festivals internationally. And then and then, yeah, that was kind of just um confirmation to keep doing it because people were watching. So, yeah. So Extractions covers a lot of topics um, in a very intersectional way, especially for a shorter film. You know, and many people, even those maybe working on some of those issues, may not think of the connections of art, gender, sexuality, war, child protective services, mental health, research extraction. Um, but you do such an incredible job showing these connections. What would you like to see the art and film industry, as well as movements that are working on these problems, do to address the intersectional nature of these issues? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think probably like for me, the most pressing thing right now is climate change. So if there's more film companies that were like dedicated to sort of like reducing sort of like fossil fuel use and, you know, things like that. And also, you know, like giving back to communities that they're like shooting in, um, like, um, I guess, I guess like, like we're working on like a feature film right now. And like part of our strategy is to hire local indigenous people to sort of like apprentice, like as crew members and stuff. Um, I think also just like being aware of what it politically means to be in Canada and like um, sort of the things Canada's involved with in terms of like resource extraction and um, the child welfare industry and um yeah, I think, I don't know. It's a hard question, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a big question to try to answer, especially in a in a Q and a <laughs> yeah. But, you know, really like sort of addressing that, you know, the use of, you know, resource extractive industries and, you know, in art and creative practices, you know, so many of them fund museums and film festivals and all sorts of creative practices. And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that, like how much like dirty money, it, not that money is not dirty in general, but is involved in the arts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I had this issue when I was um, in the Whitney Biennial, which I made another video that's like part of this trilogy called Less Lethal Fetishes. And um, what happened was Warren B. Canders um, was on the board the year I was in the Biennial and um He's a war profiteer who made tear gas that was like used in Palestine and and on the U.S.-Mexico border and all these other places that, you know, like really, really, really awful injustice. And and um, it was just so st st stressful trying to deal with like people wanted him off the board. And then also it's just like, you know, it's I don't know, like there's a lot of galleries that get money from sketchy places and, you know, but it's like a lot of money. So I don't know complicated issues. Yeah, it's it's hard, you know, running crushing colonialism. I'm I'm always looking for money to keep us going, but also I don't want to take money from the the places that have it. It's it's a tough call because they owe us. They owe us so much. But also I, you don't want to be beholden to them either. It's it's mm -hmm. a tightrope to walk. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. So I think many of us in the arts have this grand and sometimes somewhat naive view, especially when you're early in your career, that, you know, artistic expression can bring awareness and even solutions to the world's problems. But as you mentioned in your film, many of the industries responsible for these problems are funding the arts, like 
they're making these big decisions. And to some extent, like who whose art is available to the world, who whose voices gets to be seen, you know, so how do we get away from this? Like, how do we move resources for indigenous artists and, and other marginalized, you know, artists and creatives so that you can do this important work? Yeah, um, I mean, that's another big question. <laughs> um, I guess really it's like I, I'm like a big believer in like community based art practices and in like, you know, sort of teaching emerging indigenous creatives like skills and things like that. Um, I don't know. I guess like I come out of like sort of like a DIY, like kind of punk kind of uh, community and sort of aesthetic and and I guess, I don't know, I guess there's still part of me that's like a scrappy punk that just wants these like little, you know, like, like communities like that are supporting each other and to not have to play the the big art game with all the like money people. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like there are projects I want to do that I need a lot more money for. And I'm just lucky that like I'm here in Canada and there are some like arts councils and and um, telefilm and things like that to like support us. But um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge for sure. You know, this event is you know, it's taking place here in Winnipeg. Um, and, you know, in instructions, you address the large number of Native children that are taken by the government, specifically in Manitoba, mm -hmm. and, and as, you know, a money-making resource for colonizers. And you talk about choosing not to live in Winnipeg due to the fear that if you had children, they'd be taken from you simply for being Indigenous. Um, were there also concerns for you about, you know, if you had children, would you also possibly lose them for being openly you know, to us LGBTQIA or, you know, diagnosed with bipolar disorder? Yeah, I'm not so worried about the like being queer part, I think, because like I haven't heard a lot of cases um, in more recent times about people losing their kids for that reason in Canada. Um, not to say it doesn't happen, but I, I haven't heard too much about that. But like the bipolar thing, like it does worry me because um, because like that is a reason people would say that, you know, your kids are in danger or something, especially if you're like having an episode and you have to go to the hospital. And, and I talk about that a little bit in the film, like if you have to go to the hospital and then like you it, like say I didn't have somebody to look after my kids, then they, they might go into care and and they do like do care temporarily in certain cases, but that doesn't mean you'll get them back. Um, so it's yeah, definitely difficult. Um, yeah. And and I think also like um, poverty has also been like a reason that pe people's kids get taken into care. I mean, I'll, there's there's like a whole bunch. Of, I mean, sometimes there's not even a good reason. And people, you know, go to child and family services and try to like, you know, be like, what can I do? And there's really not like they'll prove that they're not on drugs or anything and they still won't get their kids back. So it's just it's really yeah, it's really awful. Yeah, that's different different government but similar issues in the u.s like disabled people still openly queer people um you know have their children taken from them all the time native people you know so when i myself was thinking when i was younger do i want to have kids or not those were things i thought about like you know i couldn't physically have one so it was like would anyone allow me to adopt or foster and the answer is no Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, seeing, watching you talk about that, it, it really struck a chord with me. Like, you know, indigenous people don't have reproductive justice. Like we don't have the same accesses to, to the resources that, that are ours to begin with. And we're not allowed to, I guess, to exercise our rights, to be full humans, to have children, to not have children, to, to live where we want to live, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah and like um what is it called non-insured health benefits for like indigenous people in canada like they'll pay for like all the like you know contraception you want but like when i was doing fertility treatments they would not pay for any of the medications and those were like really expensive medications but yeah and you know you just think like reconciliation of course you should pay to like make more indigenous children but no <laughs> not going to yeah, yeah, no, we we don't want the more we don't want more natives. No, we got to yeah. get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know this event, like we are really focusing heavily on our two spirit and other queer relatives. 
But a lot of what people are talking about today and some of the things they're working on are, you know, they themselves have been put in some kind of colonial so-called care system, whether it's residential schools or child protective services. And and a lot of the folks here today also work on the issues of like our murdered and missing relatives. Um, do you see connections between that like resource extraction of our Native children as well as just our people in general? And and specifically, what do you feel like that looks like in, say, Winnipeg versus other parts of Canada since you're from different areas and have kind of lived in a few different spots? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's all... I mean, it's like kind of like this long range plan to just disappear us all, I think, like like if um, kids are taken away from their families and they lose access to like their traditions and sort of like um, their and sometimes their territory and, you know, like and their community. And um, it's a it's a long struggle for them to like find their way back to um, the people that they belong to. And um, yeah. And what was the other part of your question? <laughs> um, just what kind of connections you maybe see, if at all, between that like extraction of our children and being taken away um, and just our murdered and missing relatives in general. And, you know, you've lived in all kind of different places in Canada and wanted to live in Winnipeg. And, you know, just as and as somebody who's not from so-called Canada, I'm kind of curious, like, how does it look different across the country? you know, considering these issues. Yeah, I mean, th there's definitely like issues going on in Winnipeg right now, especially with like um, the police refusing to search a landfill. And it's so obviously a decision that was based on the fact that the the women whose bodies they think are in the landfill are indigenous. And um, yeah, a lot of really like I mean, people know where the government's priorities lie and it's not with indigenous people. Um, and when their priorities are with Indigenous people, it's more about like getting access to the resources that are on our lands and like kind of dispossessing us of our lands and things like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's such a big thing. <laughs> it's like colonization and um, homicide and um, and land theft. And I don't know. I mean... I don't know if it is different like across Canada. Like I know there's very like some very specific concerns going on in Manitoba right now. Um, but at the same time, there's like racism like all across Canada um, in most territories. And like I, I also made a, a short uh, video recently about racism in Saskatchewan. And a lot of the stories that I was getting told by my interviewees were like, the same kinds of like, you know, violence and just all the all the awful things that come with colonization and being like mostly indigenous women that I was interviewing, like their sort of their experiences of of that kind of like misogynist racism in Saskatchewan. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know, in the U.S., it's well, some states are better than others, but they're all pretty terrible, you know. Mm hmm. Yeah. So switching gears just a little bit, um, so what advice do you have for Indigenous people, especially our Two-Spirit and other queer relatives who want to get into filmmaking? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess there's like a lot of like film festivals and sort of like artist-run centers in Canada that um, have programs for sort of like emerging artists to like make a film or like learn to make a video. I mean, you can also like apply to film school, but I think like community based learning is also really key, especially maybe for people who don't feel so confident with the education system and want to like experience more like hands on like um, learning. Um, that's kind of how I started, like with workshops and um, and I was going to video in a lot in Vancouver, which was like a video production artist run center. So and there's like artist run centers like that all across Canada. Um, I think also like there's community groups that like bring in artists to like teach video making skills to their their youth. I think that's always a good, good way to get into it. Um, yeah. Yeah, very into the workshop thing. <laughs> and then also there's just like, you know, if you're learning editing, like you can do a lot of that with like YouTube tutorials and stuff. So, yeah. 
Yeah, it definitely feels a little easier to get into some of the different creative practices outside of having to go, you know, to undergrad and grad school and all mm -hmm. of those things. You know, the 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 routes that often cost a lot of money and take a fair amount of privilege. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where is the best place for for folks to find your films and your work? Yeah, I mean, the best place would be V-Tape, which is a distributor in Toronto. And um, if you're like looking a program, they will usually give you like a password to look at stuff. Um, if you're just wanting to see like some of the things I've made without like signing up to, to V-Tape, then you can also find them on Vimeo. It's, I think it's Vimeo.com slash Thursacutend, which is my dead name, but Vimeo won't let me change it for some reason. Um yeah. Or you can Google TJ Cuthand in Vimeo and I think they will find it. Um, also, like probably the best place for like my writing would be tjcuthand.com, which is my blog that I um, kind of overshare on and, uh, and also like post links to like projects I'm working on and stuff. All right. Well, do you have any any projects coming out you'd like to share with us? Um, I guess I also have this short on Crave right now, which is only for Canadians, but um, it's called Quesquaseo She Whistles, and it's um, it's a short version of a feature film that I'm working on. So we're hoping to shoot it next year. And um, what else am I working on? Oh yeah, and I'm just finishing a video game called Carmilla the Lonely, which I'm hoping to get online this uh fall. So you can follow my website for news about that. All right. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, I think that's everything. Just, um, I don't know. Uh, I think Indigenous women and girls and two spirits should know that they're loved. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's about it. All right. Well, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to do this Q&A and for letting us show your film. Oh, sure. Yeah. Anytime. All right.